This is a quick tour of a temporal bone CT. The intention is that if you're a new resident or wanting to brush up, this can kind of quickly get you familiar with all the different structures you look at on a temporal bone CT. I'm going to do that by going through the template that I use for dictation that outlines all the different structures that I look at. For several of the structures, I'll also point out some of the different pathologies that can occur affecting those structures, and that kind of helps reinforce why that's actually an important thing to look at and know. If you want to, you can follow along at neurorad.link slash cttbone. That will bring up a, a web page looking pretty much exactly like what you're seeing right here. Another thing I want to note is that this is actually a little DICOM viewer, so you're able to scroll through a temporal bone CT. Um, you can scroll through the sequences much like you would in a pack setup. If you right click, that allows you to window and level. If you double click, that zooms in a little bit. If you left click and drag, that zooms in even more. And then if you double click, that will reset your view. Also note that there's two sequences here you can look at. There's an axial and a coronal. So click the coronal, that'll bring that up. Window that out a little bit. And then we'll just start by going through uh, kind of each sentence in my template. Roughly, I go from outside to in. So we start with the external auditory canal. That's nicely laid out on a coronal MPR. So the external auditory canal is pretty simple, doesn't give people a lot of trouble. You can see it from the outside and it courses medially to terminate as the tympanic membrane. There's two parts to the external auditory canal. There's a cartilaginous portion and there's a bony portion. At the medial aspect you have the tympanic membrane and there are two attachments of the tympanic membrane. The superior attachment is called the scutum. This has kind of a sharp appearance with a sharp point. The analog to the scutum inferiorly is called the tympanic annulus and that's this little pyramidal structure that you see at the inferior aspect. The tympanic membrane has two different parts as well. You have a pars flaccida at the superior aspect attaching to the scutum and a pars tensa at the inferior aspect attaching to the tympanic annulus. This is all important in the context of cholesteatomas, and in particular, acquired cholesteatomas. When you get an acquired pars flaccida cholesteatoma, that occurs at the superior aspect, and cholesteatomas cause bony destruction. So the first thing it'll erode is the scutum. So you need to get used to what a nice, sharp, normal scutum looks like, because eventually, you're going to be asking yourself the question, is that scutum normal, or is it eroded? Cholesteatomas can also sneak into Prusik's space, which is the air in the epitympanum of the middle ear between the head of the malleus and the lateral aspect of the middle ear. So you can also get pars tensa cholesteatomas that erode the tympanic annulus. These are much, much, much less common than pars flaccida cholesteatomas, but it's still good to get used to what a normal tympanic annulus looks like. So. On to the middle ear. Uh, one note, the middle ear is roughly divided into three different, um, three different areas. You have an epitympanum, a mesotympanum, and a hypotympanum. So the landmarks for that are, if you draw a line from the scutum to the facial nerve, tympanic segment underneath the lateral semicircular canal, everything above that is the epitympanum. And if you draw a line from the tympanic annulus to the cochlear promontory, everything below that is the hypotympanum, leaving everything essentially behind the tympanic membrane as the mesotympanum. So we're going to switch to the axial to discuss the middle ear further. So I talk about middle ear aeration in the tympanic membrane first. The next thing I talk about is soft tissue masses in the epitympanic space. That's essentially referring to looking for cholesteatomas, also discussing the scutum not being effaced, and then I discuss the adidas ad antrum and the ossicles. So probably the most common view of the ossicles or the, the um, best shot of the ossicles is what you're looking at right here. On the axial image you can see what looks like an ice cream cone with ice cream here and a cone here. The ice cream is the head of the malleus and the cone is the body and short process of the incus. 
as we follow that down, we can see other structures of the malleus. The manubrium is the structure of the malleus that's going to articulate with the tympanic membrane. You see that laid out there. With the incus, you have a long process that extends down and articulates with this wispy structure that you can barely see, and that's the stapes. The stapes has two legs that attach to a foot plate that identify the oval window, which is right at the vestibule of the semicircular canal. If you go down from the oval window, you run into this little air pocket that goes to the basal turn of the cochlea, and that is the round window. So you have oval window attaching to the stapes. More inferiorly, you have round window going to the basal turn of the cochlea. <coughs> so those are some of the major points with the ossicles. Another structure worth talking about within the middle ear are the two muscles. So you'll notice here, at the anterior aspect of the middle ear cavity, you have your eustachian tube. Intimately associated with your eustachian tube is the tensor tympani tendon and muscle. This comes into the middle ear, makes a 90 degree turn of the cochlear promontory, and then inserts on the manubrium of the malleus. And you can barely make out that tensor tympani muscle right there. The other muscle within the middle ear is the stapedius tendon. That is associated or right next to the facial nerve mastoid segment. So there is the facial nerve mastoid segment. It looks like an opacified air cell right next to it, but that's actually the stapedius tendon. That's going to come out of the pyramidal eminence, go into the middle ear, and attach to the stapes. A lot of times you can't really see it. You can't really see it on this study either, but it does get there. So the next thing I talk about is the adidas ad antrum. So that is the entry to the attic, or the entry to the mastoid air cells. So here we have the epitympanum. This is the adidas ad antrum. And then this is the central mastoid tract, or the mastoid antrum. It's the largest portion of the mastoid air cells. If this adidas ad antrum becomes occluded by a soft tissue mass or mucosal thickening, it can lead to fluid buildup within the mastoid air cells and potential superinfection. It's an analog of the sinus drainage pathways within the paranasal sinuses. All right, then moving all the way medial, we have the internal auditory canal. Now, I make a comment about how it's normal in size, basically saying that if there was a huge vestibular schwannoma, maybe you would see some scalloping that might lead you to that. It's not a very common observation. Then we'll move on to the inner ear. So the inner ear is surrounded by the otic capsule, which is basically the really, really dense bone of the petrous temporal bone surrounding all of the inner ear structures. Within the otic capsule is the labyrinthine structures. Now the big structures are the cochlea, the semicircular canals, and the vestibule. And those are the things that I comment on. So starting with the vestibule and semicircular canals. The vestibule is at the base of the semicircular canals, kind of an oval structure. And within the vestibule is contained the utricle and the saccule. And useful landmarks for knowing where those are, are the divisions of the vestibular nerve. So we know the vestibular nerve comes in the internal auditory canal, and it has three divisions, a superior, an inferior, and posterior divisions. So I'm at the top part of the IAC right now, and I can see this little notch here. That's the superior portion of the vestibular nerve that's going to go to the utricle of the semicircular canal, roughly here. As we go down, you can make out a little notch right there, and that's the inferior division of the vestibular nerve that will go to the saccule. And then as we go down further, we see another notch that courses to the ampulla of the posterior semicircular canal. That's the posterior division of the vestibular nerve. And then we have three semicircular canals. We have a superior semicircular canal that you see here. That's best laid out on the coronal NPR. And we see that there. There is a bony landmark for the superior semicircular canal called the arcuate eminence. That's a useful landmark for surgeons to know where they're at and know what structures are underneath. The lateral semicircular canal points laterally in the axial plane, and it can be identified as well by a promontory within the middle ear that marks the location of the lateral semicircular canal. The tympanic segment of the facial nerve that my mouse is pointing at 
runs directly under the lateral semicircular canal. So those are very important landmarks for knowing where the facial nerve is at. Finally, the posterior semicircular canal is directed kind of posteriorly and laterally. Another structure associated with that region is the vestibular aqueduct. You see it as this small structure here. It contains the endolymphatic sac and it courses towards the posterior semicircular canal. It's pretty small in this patient and you actually can't see it very well. Another thing worth mentioning in discussion of the semicircular canals is the phenomenon of superior semicircular canal dehiscence. Occasionally the arcuate eminence can become the bony covering over it can become thinned and the superior semicircular canal exposed to pulsating CSF and cause a variety of otologic symptoms. So it's good to get familiar with identifying the superior semicircular canal and evaluating the bony covering over it. The last thing I want to talk about with the discussion of the otic capsule is the fissula antifenestrum. Fissula basically means cleft. Antifenestrum means in front of the window. And the window we're talking about here is the oval window. So it's the cleft in front of the oval window. So again, if we identify the stapes foot plate, that's the oval window. This bone in front of the oval window is the area of that you're identifying when you're trying to find the fissile endofenestrum. The fissile is a tiny cleft, but the bone is what we're really concerned about. When you get otospongiosis or otosclerosis, it starts with bony resorption of enchondral bone, and it tends to start in this area. So become familiar with what normal bone looks like in this area. In front of the oval window, lateral to the cochlea, should be nice and dense. If you're losing density there, that makes you concerned about otospongiosis. All right. Moving on from the inner ear structures, I'm going to talk about the facial nerve and the course of the facial nerve. So there's a lot of twists and turns to it that are useful to become familiar with. It's going to come out of the brainstem, pons, pontomedullary junction region. It's going to be the cisternal segment in the cerebellopontine angle cistern. Once it enters the internal auditory canal, it is the canalicular segment. Then it's going to pierce the otic capsule and course above the cochlea. And that short segment there is called the canalicular segment. Then it's going to become the geniculate ganglion, which you can kind of see a shadow of here. And then it's going to make a 270 degree turn, and it's going to course under the lateral semicircular canal that you see here as the tympanic segment. Now, a helpful thing to know is that the prefix temp means middle ear. So anytime you hear something with the prefix temp, more than likely it's referring to a structure in the middle ear. So the tympanic segment of the facial nerve runs through the middle ear. The tensor tympani is a muscle that uh, runs through the middle ear. The tympanic membrane is the covering of the middle ear. The tegmen tympani is the uh, superior covering over the middle ear. Anyway, tympanic segment of the facial nerve and then coursing inferiorly it becomes the mastoid segment of the facial nerve. It's right next to the cepedius tendon that you can again see there. And then it's going to exit out the stylomastoid foramen. Now as a little bonus structure, occasionally you can make out a little structure coming off of the facial nerve. You see here that courses superiorly and actually enters into the middle ear. And on this study you can actually see a tiny wisp of it. That's actually the corda tympani nerve. It's going to course between the malleus and the incus and exit through the petrotympanic fissure to join the lingual nerve and supply taste from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. All right, and moving on, we have our vascular structures associated with the temporal bone. The first thing I discuss is the carotid canal. So you can see here is the carotid artery. It's going to course up towards the cavernous sinus. You want to make sure that's not deviated too far laterally, actually um, becoming an aberrant internal carotid artery that courses into the middle ear. You wouldn't want a surgeon biopsying a pulsatile red mass that they think is a paraganglioma, and it's actually the internal carotid artery. Then we have our venous structures. So the sigmoid sinus can be identified by this notch here. As we come down, it becomes the jugular vein. So there, the jugular vein is divided by 
this bony spine here into two different foramina. You have your pars nervosa that's more anterior and medial and smaller. That contains the ninth cranial nerve, the glossopharyngeal nerve. Then lateral to that, you have your pars vascularis that contains the 10th and 11th cranial nerves. And then I comment on mastoid aeration as a final point as well, which we've already discussed. The last thing I discuss is the temporal mandibular joint. And basically just making note of any arthritis that might be occurring in the temporal mandibular joint. You can imagine that somebody may have symptoms referable to their temporal bone, and it's actually symptoms of uh, TMJ osteoarthritis. So that is uh, most of the structures that I evaluate routinely on every CT of the temporal bones. Hope this helps.